another huge win destroying some gun control that the government has been leaning on for decades. And before I jump into the details, this is a message for the YouTube censor crew. I'm using actual scientific words and reading directly from a court case that was decided here in the United States. So back up off me. Guys and gals, marijuana and the prohibition of the Second Amendment for users of marijuana has been deemed unconstitutional. Can you hear that? That's the screaming of the anti-gunners. They lost two huge cases this past week, and I'm going to tell you all about it. Before I jump into this video, I want to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, and that's the Sonoran Desert Institute. Guys and gals, many of us gun owners like to tinker with or repair or upgrade our own firearms. Well, not, why not turn that passion into a career? SDI is a distance learning institute where all of the tools and materials are shipped directly to your door. They have classes like ballistics, gunsmithing, armorers courses, and even drone classes. Start the path at getting your certificate or your degree at the link down below, sdi.edu. Thank you to SDI for sponsoring this video. All right, guys, first off, subscribe to the channel. We hit 600,000 subscribers last night, and I am so grateful and so humbled for your support. Thank you. It's been a long time this channel has been in, in operation, and uh, we're not stopping. So if you like the videos, please hit that like button, and if you enjoy news on the Second Amendment multiple times a day, subscribe to the channel, hit that bell icon, and let's continue fighting for what is right. All right. This video, I'm going to talk to you about what happened in the Western District of Oklahoma in a court decision that struck down a major uh, restriction on the Second Amendment that the government has been leaning on, and uh, it was just, just destroyed. So let's jump into it. Here is the first page of the actual court decision, and you can see it's the United States of America versus Jared Michael Harrison. Quick intro here, it says, Before the court is defendant Jared Michael Harrison's motion to dismiss the indictment, which argues that the statute he is charged with violating, 18 U.S.C. 922 G3, is unconstitutionally vague, in violation of the Due Process Clause, and unconstitutionally infringes upon his fundamental right to possess a firearm in violation of the Second Amendment. For the reasons given below, the motion is granted. Let's jump right into the facts of the case here. On May 20th of 2022, Harrison was pulled over by an officer of the Lawton Police Department for failing to stop at a red light. When Harrison rolled down his window to speak to the officer, the officer smelled marijuana and questioned Harrison about the source of the smell. Harrison told the officer that he was on his way to work at a medical marijuana dispensary, but that he did not have a state-issued medical marijuana card. The officer asked Harrison to step out of his car. When he did, the officer noticed that Harrison was wearing an ankle monitor. Harrison told the officer that he was on probation in Texas for aggravated assault. The officer searched Harrison and found no contraband. The officer did not conduct a field sobriety test, nor did he request a blood draw to determine if Harrison was under the influence of marijuana or some other unlawful substance. Another officer arrived and the two officers searched Harrison's car. They found a loaded revolver on the driver's side floorboard, two prescription bottles in the driver's side door, one empty and one containing partially smoked marijuana cigarettes. Why do people keep their roaches? That always gets them jammed up. And a backpack in the passenger seat. The backpack contained marijuana, THC gummies, and two THC vape cartridges, and a pre-rolled marijuana cigarette and marijuana stems in a tray. Harrison was arrested at the scene. The next day, the state of Oklahoma charged him with possession of marijuana, possession of paraphernalia, and failure to obey a traffic signal. Harrison is awaiting trial on those charges. Then, on August 17th of 2022, a federal grand jury returned an indictment charging Harrison with possessing a firearm with knowledge that he was an unlawful user of marijuana in violation of 18 U.S.C. 922 G3. So the question is on the 4473. Every time you buy a gun from a F F from a FFL, <laughs> every time you buy a gun from an FFL, <laughs> it's, man, it's one of those days already. <laughs> but you get the drift. Is that question? Are you an unlawful user of marijuana? And you, if you say yes, then you're federally prohibited. If you say no, then you're not federally prohibited. But if you get caught with weed, then you can get jammed up because, or you will get jammed up because 
marijuana is still federally illegal. Now, Oklahoma is a state that it is still illegal. However, it has, it has been approved for medicinal use. So can something that can be used for medicine because it's beneficial be used to restrict your right? Well, in no other case would any person say, well, you're taking Advil for headaches, therefore you can't have a driver's license. Uh, you know, you, you put some uh, Dr. Scholl's goo on your bunion, so therefore you're not allowed to walk for the rest of your life. It makes no sense. However, the government and the gun controllers grab at anything, any straw they can grab to try to restrict someone's right to keep and bear arms. And the government, we'll get into the, a little bit of the argument. I'm not going to go crazy, but there are definitely some things that this court said and put on paper that are going to be used to shred, not only just shred this uh, restriction, but many others, thanks to the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. I also want to say that all of the, all of the media, because they're all anti-gun, are saying that Bruin expanded gun rights and it, did not, it didn't do that at all. What it did is it, it restricted the ability of government to restrict our unalienable right. Okay, so with that said, let's get into a little bit of the, uh, the argument here because what the government said and what this court does in response to what they say is phenomenal. Harrison argues that the incident should be dismissed for both due process clause and second amendment reasons. Because the court resolves the motion on the second amendment grounds, the court won't even reach Harrison's due process claim or describe Harrison's argument in that regard because the second amendment violation in and of itself is a violation of his rights. As for the second amendment, Harrison argues that he has the right to possess a firearm and that 922 G3 infringes upon that right. Relying primarily on the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, Harrison argues that the Second Amendment's plain text covers his conduct possessing a handgun and that the government cannot affirmatively prove that restrictions like 922 G3 are part of the historical traditions that define the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. Woo! Right out of the gate and he's 100% right. First, Harrison says, neither text nor history and tradition support the notion that only law-abiding individuals are part of the people protected by the Second Amendment. Second, Harrison argues that the government cannot point to any historical law on all fours with 922 G3, much less a tradition of such laws. And while Bruin may not require the government to identify a historical twin to 922 G3, where the societal problem addressed by 922 G3, users of illicit substances possessing guns, is nothing new, the government must identify distinctly similar laws in our nation's history and tradition. And this it cannot do, says Harrison. Of course, the United States disagrees. First, the government argues, Harrison is not part of the people protected by the Second Amendment because he is not a law-abiding citizen. This being so, the government argues, the burden never shifts to it to affirmatively prove that restrictions like 922 G3 are part of the historical traditions that define the outer bounds of the right to keep and bear arms. And even if it did, there is a historical tradition of preventing presumptively risky people like felons and the mentally ill from possessing firearms. And for purposes of the Second Amendment, concludes the government, marijuana users are no different from those because they are similarly unvirtuous. All right, now you get the history of it, right? Now let's get into the court destroying the government's argument <laughs> because it's phenomenal and this will be used time and time again, but I don't think I don't know if the government's going to appeal this and watch and listen and you tell me if I'm thinking correct. Section 922 G3 does not have deep roots. It wasn't enacted by Congress until the Gun Control Act of 1968. The statute initially prohibited any individual who was an unlawful user of or addicted to marijuana or any depressant or stimulant drug or narcotic drug from receiving a firearm. But it was amended in 1986 to broadly prohibit the receipt or possession of a firearm by any person who is an unlawful user of or addicted to any controlled substance as defined in section 102 of the Controlled Substances Act, 21 U.S.C. 802. In its modern form, 922 G3 thus strips a person of their fundamental right to possess a firearm the instant the person becomes an unlawful user of marijuana. And in the United States view, all users of marijuana are unlawful users. The question here is thus whether stripping someone of their right to possess a firearm solely because they use marijuana is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. If it is not, 
then 922 G3 cannot be constitutionally applied to Harrison, no matter the reasonableness of the policy it embodies. So next the court goes after the government's claim that Harrison is not one of the we the people. He's not part of the people protected by the constitutional right to keep and bear arms. And they, they kill that real good too. No one disputes that Harrison is an American citizen who has resided in the United States his entire life, which under Supreme Court precedent would make him part of the national community and thus part of the people to whom the Second Amendment guarantees the right to keep arms. The United States argues, however, that marijuana users are lawbreakers and lawbreakers aren't part of the people whose rights are protected by the Constitution. But this is precisely the sort of carving out of a subset from all Americans that the Heller court rejected. So the court's saying you're violating Heller. Your argument alone is in violation of Heller. Oh <laughs> uh, yes, he's part of the people. He has a, a right, an unalienable right to keep and bear arms. And it's getting better because the court addresses like, if you think he was so bad, then why was he free? <laughs> it's good. Given that the Second Amendment presumptively protects Harrison's conduct, the burden shifts to the United States to demonstrate that prohibiting marijuana users from possessing firearms is consistent with the nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. To begin, the United States points to seven laws. One 1655 law from colonial Virginia and six state or territorial laws enacted between 1868 and 1899 that it argues categorically prohibited the intoxicated from possessing firearms. But the government overstates its case. Start with comparing the burden each of these laws placed on the right of armed self-defense vis-a-vis the burden imposed by 922 G3. The seven laws the United States identifies imposed a far narrower burden and as a result left ample room for the exercise of the core right to arm self-defense. First, the restrictions imposed by each law only applied while an individual was actively intoxicated or actively using intoxicants. Under these laws, no one's right to arm self-defense was restricted based on the mere fact that he or she was a user of intoxicants. Second, none of the laws appeared to have prohibited the mere possession of a firearm. Third, far from being a total prohibition applicable to all intoxicated persons in all places, all the laws appear to have applied to public places or activities or even to a narrow subset of public places. And one only applied to a narrow subset of intoxicated persons. Importantly, none appear to have prohibited the possession of a firearm in the home for purposes of self-defense. So the court pokes holes in all of the BS that the government said, oh look, this one says that they can't carry a gun. Look, this one says we should, hey judge, believe this one. And there's one more thing I wanna show you and then we get to the conclusion because the stuff that these judges said, guys and gals, are going to live in infamy because they're gonna be used over and over and over again to destroy gun control. Where the seven laws the United States identifies took a scalpel to the right of armed self-defense, narrowly carving out exceptions, but leaving most of the right in place, 922 G3 takes a sledgehammer to the right. Recall that 922 G3 imposes the most severe burden possible, a total prohibition on possessing any firearm in any place for any use in any circumstance, regardless of whether the person is actually intoxicated or under the influence of a controlled substance. It is a complete deprivation of the core right to possess a firearm for self-defense, turning entirely on the fact that the individual is a user of marijuana. Section 922 G3's burden on the right of armed self-defense is thus not comparable to the seven historical intoxication laws. And finally, the conclusion of the court None of this is to say that the government cannot play a role in protecting the public from dangerous persons possessing firearms. It can, and it should. For example, if the state of Texas thought that Harrison's alleged involvement in a shooting demonstrated that Harrison was a danger to the public, it could have demonstrated to a Texas judge in an individualized proceeding of which Harrison would have been given notice and the opportunity to be heard that Harrison ought to be jailed while awaiting trial for the shooting. The Constitution, after all, permits pretrial detention, and such detention would be a highly effective means for furthering the government's interest in protecting the public from a gun-toting Harrison. But that didn't happen. Harrison was released pending trial in Texas, 
And so here we are, with the federal government now arguing that Harrison's mere status as a user of marijuana justifies stripping him of his fundamental right to possess a firearm. For all the reasons given above, this is not a constitutionally permissible means of disarming Harrison. Because the court concludes that 18 U.S.C. 922 G3 violates Harrison's Second Amendment right to possess a firearm, the court declines to reach Harrison's vagueness claim, because they don't have to. The motion to dismiss the indictment is granted. Accordingly, the indictment is dismissed with prejudice. It is so ordered on this third day of February 2023, Judge Patrick R. Wyrick, U.S. District Court Judge. Boom! Mind blown because this is going to continue to happen. And this is the first time I've seen a judge say, listen, if he was such a bad person, you should have put him in jail, but you didn't, so here we are. And that is amazing because why has crime skyrocketed in the last three years, guys and gals? Anybody else want to gander to guess? It's because they're, they're, they're treating criminals with kid gloves. They're not holding them accountable. They're not holding people accountable for what they do. In some cities, New York City, are even revoking the cash bail process, meaning you, you offend, you go right back out. There's nothing to stop you from offending again, two, three, four, five times a day. And we know it's BS. We know it's part of this scheme to take the guns from the law abiding. And thankfully, this court has destroyed the U.S.'s uh, facade of, hey, have you ever smoked weed once in your life? Well, then you're forever in your life a dangerous person and you can never have your Second Amendment right especially in a state that it's being used for medicinal reasons. Now, does that mean that's why he was using it for medicinal reasons? No. But you know what? Uh, like I said earlier, if you speed and you get a speeding ticket, should you ever, should you be forbidden from driving ever again? If you tell cops, I don't have anything on me, and then you do after a search, should you never be protected from unlawful searches and seizures again? Is there any other right in which you do something once and you will never have that right again? Is, that, is there something there? There isn't. So why should it apply to the Second Amendment? You have to ask yourself, guys and gals. You know, this is a good time to be alive in the Second Amendment community. Uh, the justices in Bruin, the justices in Heller, the justices in McDonald, the justices in Caetano, it is all bringing us to the point we want to be and it is destroying all of this unconstitutional gun control and it's happening regularly. And we're going to see a lot more of it. If you want to stay in the loop, then like the video, share the video down below, and subscribe to this channel. I'll bring you Second Amendment news every single day, often multiple times a day. Check out SDI so that you can start your career in the firearms community. And until we see each other again, be safe, stay vigilant, and carry a gun to keep you, your friends, your family, your community safe. I'll see you on the next one, hopefully with another court destroying governmental restrictions on our core right to keep and bear arms. Take care, y'all.